Hello everybody, welcome to Cork and Java. We got a very special guest for you today. It's Jake from the Tasting Anarchy podcast. We're going to be talking about how the government is in your drink, and we're also going to be reviewing some Bordeaux for you. So stay tuned. Hello everybody, welcome back to Cork and Java, your go-to place for coffee and wine reviews and how-tos. On this channel, we like to expand and enrich your experience with all of your favorite beverages. So if that's interesting to you, consider hitting that subscribe button below and the little bell so you're notified when future videos come out. All right, let's get to it. Jake from the Tasting Anarchy podcast. How's it going, man? It's going really well, how are you? Doing great. So you're drinking a Bordeaux, I'm drinking a Bordeaux. Tell me a little bit about uh, the one you're drinking. Well, this one is, it's from a, it's from a Chateau Arthurus or Arthus. Uh, it is uh, 2014. It's from, well, it used to be the Castellon subregion, but it's now uh, Cote de Bordeaux because uh, I think five regions came together to work on marketing together. They're not contiguous regions, but they, they work together on marketing and stuff. If you like St. Emilion's from uh, Bordeaux, which is right bank, uh, very Merlot heavy, uh, you'll probably like this a lot. It's right next door to it. So when you see uh, Cote de Bordeaux from the Castellon subregion, that's going to be very similar to St. Emilion's, but you're going to get a good deal because it's a newer region or a newer, I guess, marketing strategy. It really hasn't permeated the American market yet. Awesome. Well, I'm drinking a left bank Bordeaux, and it comes from the Medoc region. And uh, it's, it's really good. I'm looking forward to doing a full review after uh, we talk a little bit about Liberty. So, um, yeah. So tell us, tell us about the Tasting Anarchy podcast. What do you guys do over there? Okay, so the Tasting Anarchy podcast, uh, our slogan is how much government is in your drink. And that's basically what we cover is we do every, every week we do a review of uh, one or two wines. Uh, I have a co-host and so he often, and we don't, he lives in actually near where you live uh, in mm -hmm. Virginia. And I live here in Texas, and so usually we do separate wines, but occasionally we'll send each other wines and, and do the same one. Uh, so we do a review, and then we usually get into some sort of topic uh, involving the government <laughs> being involved in your drink. And uh, we also do reviews with growers and winemakers. Uh, I don't have a huge number of those yet, but we've started branching out a lot into that area. I, I also, we did. I went and did a uh, vineyard planting a couple of months ago. We did a couple of episodes about that. I'm doing a harvest uh, this month, uh, so it'll just be. It's just kind of a lot of the wine industry, but from the perspective of the government distorting the wine industry. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, this isn't a channel that we really get into politics very much, so. Can you kind of explain what uh, anarchy means and kind of how you subscribe to that term? Because I don't want people thinking I just brought somebody in from Antifa in here or something like that. Right. Well, so there's there's uh, and you'll if you'll probably get comments about this in in the uh, in the comments area is there there's really two schools of anarchism. So there's there's right anarchism and left anarchism. Antifa is kind of left anarchists. Uh, from my perspective, they all turn out to just be communists. And uh, they and it ends up being an authoritarian state. Right anarchists, on the other hand, are in favor of free markets and private property. So, and then uh, right anarchists in in my school of thought, our fundamental value is something called the NAP, which is the non-aggression principle, which means you can do, to you know, to borrow a phrase from the economist Walter Block, you can do whatever you damn well please, just keep your hands to yourself. Yeah, sounds like yeah. a system kind of based. On voluntar voluntarism. Kind yeah, of. It, it is. We got a lot of voluntarists, a lot of agorists, a lot of people mm -hmm. who describe themselves in different ways. Uh, I, I always say anarcho-capitalist, uh, but capitalism has a lot of baggage with it as well. So a lot of people choose some other way to describe them. But it's just basically everybody should be allowed to have voluntary interactions and any involuntary act interaction is illegitimate. Yeah, including uh, the state, right? Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay. So how, what got you into wine? Like, what's your story about wine? Well, uh, my co-host and I, we knew that I was moving to Texas. And we, we, I, we both lived in Virginia Beach. And uh, actually, then we both moved to Norfolk. But uh, we, were, we were looking for something to do together to have a good excuse to have a call every week and, and just kind of talk about what we normally talked about. And we used to, I used to run the Libertarian 
the Young Libertarian Party in Virginia Beach, and he and I would get together once or twice a month, and we would just have beers and cigars or whatever and just talk liberty stuff. And then we both kind of moved into other areas of our lives. I became an anarchist first, and then he became an anarchist. And so like our kind of our political activism sort of went in a different direction. And uh, But we still enjoy each other's company, and so we decided – we wanted to do a podcast and around the same time, both of us were, I wouldn't say we were losing interest in beer, but it was just not as interesting to us anymore. So we, uh, we both still like beer a lot, but he had a kid. I got married. Um, although my wife doesn't drink at all. So that didn't really affect my drinking, but I, I just started not feeling as good when I would have a couple of beers at night. But if I had a glass of wine or two, or two glasses of wine at night, I felt fine the next day. Mm -hmm. And that kind of started introducing me. Like one of my very first wines was um, uh, Freak Show Cabernet Sauvignon. It's from the it's, – it's very inexpensive. Uh, I like it a lot. It's very aggressive. It's from Lodi, Central California. Yeah, it uh, kind of seems like one of your benchmark wines for your show, it, it seems oh, like. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely because that was one that I, I used to – I didn't know what else I liked. I knew mm -hmm. I liked that, and so I would just buy a lot of that, and that's what he and I would drink together when we did wine. Yeah. And so – then he he always knew that he kind of liked white wines. I would never try them. Uh, I, I have tried a lot, a lot of them now, but uh, we decided this idea of and so it's not a financial risk to either one of us. We would just take turns buying the bottle of wine, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how the show grew up. As we started just once a week getting together, sharing a bottle of wine, and talking about kind of whatever whatever struck us and. With him and me, the conversation is almost always libertarian stuff. So, yeah. uh, and like to, to the anarchist end of the spectrum in, in libertarianism. So, uh, that's kind of how the show got born. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I saw in some wine news last week that President Donald Trump uh, was talking about putting tariffs on uh, France, and he mentioned French wine possibly being tariffed. And I think it's in retaliation for some something in the like tech sector so yeah uh, yeah so <laughs> this is this is what they call in europe they're kind of like referring to it as the google tax and so uh the way that that so you know obviously large mega corporations international mega corporations stuff like that they try to avoid taxes by structuring themselves in a particular way so uh what google and apple and twitter facebook all these companies they do a lot of operations in france but the way that they're structured and where they're headquartered makes it so they don't actually uh, have a lot of profits in those countries, the, particularly like places like France that have high taxes. Mm -hmm. So they'll restructure it so that their, their profits are in places like Ireland that have relatively low taxes. And so when or, – or here in the United States, which although we have actually very high taxes compared to a lot of places, but uh, they'll, they'll structure it in such a way that they have – they don't have to pay a lot of taxes in France. And so the, the EU has tried to do these, these types of taxes. Uh, they've not succeeded in doing it. And so France decided to do it on their own. They imposed this, it's a 3% tax, not on profits, on revenue. And yeah. so this is a very, very, very high tax. 3% doesn't sound like a lot, but if it's on profits, it's a very different story than if it's on revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is how they're trying to address it. Now, Trump came in and he says, "Okay, well, what you know, what does France sell to the United States? They sell they sell wine and fashion, basically. Mm -hmm. And so his initial instinct is, let's put a tariff on wine. Um, and you know, I've got a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> so, so yeah, what kind of effects does a um, a tariff on French wine affect uh, wine consu consumers here in America?" Well, consumers, it's going to. Well, this is this is one thing that Mason and I talk a lot about is that so there's there's a scene in the unseen when it comes to economics, and what's going to be the scene is that it will it will possibly hurt French producers, particularly in places like Bordeaux and Champagne, uh, the very large exporting regions. Uh, it won't hurt them a huge huge amount because in France, uh, with the exception of certain parts of Bordeaux, pretty much everything is domestically consumed. Um, there's a lot of like very minor regions in France where almost nothing gets out, and and we don't see any of that wine. It's very good wine, but they just consume all of it, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very heavy wine drinking country. So they will be they will be harmed by this. But this is not necessarily this is not something that people don't take into account when they uh, are looking at tariffs. Is that tariffs are a tax on the consumer 
in the nation that is imposing the tariff. So the people who like French wine are still going to probably buy French wine, but they're going to have to pay a premium for that because the uh, producers are not the ones that consume the tax. They do have to. They do have an additional cost imposed on collecting it and all that sort of stuff. Actually, it's probably going to be the importers that have to. Uh, bear the brunt of that, but then that that gets built into the price of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, so this creates a this creates a distortion in the market. So this is like think of like when you throw a pebble into a pond, it creates a ripple, right? Yeah. And so this creates a ripple in our market as well. And so now French wines are slightly more expensive. Which people who maybe they were buying this wine that I bought, which was twenty dollars a bottle. Now maybe this is let's say that you know it's twenty five dollars a bottle, whatever whatever the additional cost is. Now it's a little bit more expensive. And that may bump some people out of that market, but they still want to buy wine, and so they buy an American wine. Well, what does this do in the American wine? This puts a higher demand on lower cost American wines, which increase demand, makes increased costs, reduces supply, causes other people to enter the market. And when other people enter the market, this creates a bubble. And so there has been many, many wine bubbles in history, and uh, we can go back and, and look at those, but this would create if at any time these tariffs were lifted or there was a shift in the market, you know, one thing that is, is impacting wine production in the world right now is climate change, climate changes. And there, there's a lot of harvest loss, you know, here in Texas, Texas high plains, which is where a lot of the grapes here in Texas are produced, had a very, very bad year this year. And they lot like the, one of the, uh, Bowen family vineyards is, is a friend of mine. And, uh, he lost almost 90% of his harvest this year. So or and is it a from lot the of, heat, uh, from not enough rain, from hail. Wow, hail. hail. Yeah, hail, which people don't think about, but here, here, uh, especially in Texas high plains, you got to watch hail. You know, my mm -hmm. my car was totaled by hail uh, a couple months ago. Oh like, wow. Yeah, it's like it's like you know quarter size hail coming down on your car, and it just dents the entire top of it. And but this happens when on your vines, it, it hits and knocks this young fruit off, and then you don't have a large harvest. And that it, so something like this happens regionally. And it impacts the market, and this will is something that could pop the bubble. And mm -hmm. so there's been all of this additional investment in the American wine market in response to these tariffs. And it, when whatever shifts shifts, that bubble pops, and a bunch of people have to liquidate and exit the market, and creates a big hardship in the industry. And so what what the response that you really should have, and and you know if he had good economic advisors, he would he would be made to understand this is that the response to an increased tax on your products is to lower taxes and to lower trade barriers. Because another aspect of tariffs is if you lower your, your uh, trade barriers and they're selling you more of their product because the product is now slightly cheaper, they don't, they don't sell you their bottles of wine in, in euros. They sell you their bottles of wine in dollars. So now they have dollars. What do they buy with dollars? They're not going to go back to France and buy French products because all their stuff is in euros. They need to buy American products or they need to buy products from another country that has a demand for dollars because they're buying something of ours. So a one-to-one -one trade deficit between France and the United States is, is not really a problem because we have a trade surplus with other countries and those countries also trade with France. And so what you, what you really want is unilateral free trade across the board. But even if somebody else is imposing tariffs on you or putting taxes on your companies, lowering your own barriers puts pressure on them to increase their purchase of your products or, or, or through a stream, uh, you know, through a stream of, of countries purchasing your products. So, um, the, the other thing about France, you know, this is one of the, this is the, I think the, one of the largest wine producing countries in the world. And it's the, they have an absolute advantage. So there's 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 relative advantage, which means you're you're this much better at somebody else in producing the same product. Then you also have absolute advantage, which means you're the only one who can produce that product. So in the case of France, they have an absolute advantage in French wine. Nobody else produces Bordeaux. So the terroir of Bordeaux and the subregions of Bordeaux and Burgundy and Rhone and Champagne and Loire and all the and Al Alsace and all these all these different places. They have uh, they have an absolute advantage in producing the wine of that terroir, and that's one of the things that makes wine so exciting is that the place that the wine is grown imparts terroir into the wine, and you cannot get that from anywhere else. And yep. 
And so, you know, you may be able to put, and, and this is what I thought was very funny about Trump's quote about it was he was like, I, I've always liked American wine better. I don't drink wine, but I like the way it looks better. And, what? and there, I mean, that's subjective. Is there something to say about that? But <laughs> there's one interesting other fact that goes along with this is about 150 miles west of where I am right now in Virginia is, and I've been there and it's good, Trump Winery, which is owned by none other than Eric Trump, which is really? his, okay. yeah, which is wow. his second son. So I wonder if that kind of influences, of course, American wines better. Um, my son grows it and makes yeah. it. And uh, I wonder if there's some kind of conflict of interest going on there as well. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there is. I mean, you can't get into politics and not have a conflict of interest. Uh, there is, you, you always have, I mean, just your own value system is a conflict of interest. So whatever whatever Trump's values are as opposed to you know one of the people running in the DNC if they have a they have a conflicting uh, they have a conflicting value system value subjective right so uh, they have a conflicting value system so whatever action they take on either side is a conflict of interest their interest is their values and their values may change over time but it, but everybody has that so mm -hmm. uh, I can definitely see that being a possibility like that he's he has he has I mean there is a lot of evidence for this he has taken another action that has had had a tremendous benefit for his own companies um, but this is very old uh, political tactics tariffs come up all the time protectionism comes up all the time and it is always it always has a negative impact whereas if one country is imposing a tariff on you it may have a negative impact in one sector of your economy but that's no reason to spread that pain around to everybody that's another thing that I wanted to mention because China in the tariff wars has been putting a lot of um, tariffs on American made wine. Um, can you and I know you guys talked about this in, I think, episode 77 of your um, podcast. But um, can you talk about kind of what effects that that had on the American market and what should uh, uh, the best response be? Well, the best response is always to lower tariffs and lower taxes in response. That, that, that's always the best response, and it's always going to have uh, the most benefit to, for the most people in your country. That doesn't mean it's going to save the individual uh, the individual producers. And so the, the, the state that was most impacted by the Chinese tariffs is California. Uh, a lot of California. Now, the Chinese palate for wine is is different than the American palate. So the American palate is actually more fruit driven than the European palate, and the Chinese palate is more sweetness driven than the American palate. So it's so, kind of the the, the old world wines um, mm -hmm. that region still enjoys that style, whereas like more new world regions tend to like more new world style. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and and so the Chinese right now they have a huge influence. Now, granted. In my opinion, the entire Chinese economy is a huge bubble, but uh, they have a, a very fat, very quick growing middle class. A lot of their middle class, uh, the culture is based off prestige. And so they want to buy these wines uh, from Napa Valley and from Sonoma and from Russian River Valley and, and, like, and Willamette Valley, some of that. So Oregon was impacted by it as well. Um, Santa Clara Mountains, like places like that, they have had... Uh, that that those tariffs have had an impact on California producers, and actually, there's been several producers who've had to close because their almost their entire business was based off of selling to China. Mm, mm. Now, this is on the other hand been a big boon for Australian producers because Australian producers don't have the same tariff. The problem is, in in both cases, even if the tariffs were off of California, when the Chinese economic bubble pops those industries will crash anyways. And that's that's my, my that's my worry a little bit with Australia. We had a guest on, I think, in that episode, Jackson Blood, who uh, is involved in, in the wine industry. He he has a slightly different opinion of this because he thinks he thinks that Australia will, will be able to pivot. But depending on how much the Australian wine industry pivots to uh, satiate the Chinese palate, if the Chinese economy tanks and they're just not able to buy wine anymore, that is going to have a huge impact on uh, the Chinese wine, or I'm sorry, the Australian wine industry. Now, these tariffs did have a big impact on the California wine industry, uh, and, and frankly, I, I think I don't like. I, it's not a nice way to say it, but I think California the wine industry does sort of need to be taken down a peg a little bit because just because you're Napa Valley doesn't necessarily mean you're making good wine. But in a lot of places with a, a very quick growing middle class that has a lot of disposable income, 
they're not necessarily buying things. Now, granted, value subjective. This is it, it's up to them what to buy, but they're not always buying things that are well produced. They're buying things that have a prestigious name. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of this actually happening in Bordeaux and Burgundy and Rhone and places like this as well. Is that a lot of Chinese investors are coming in, they're purchasing these uh, vineyards and chateaus and stuff like that, and they're producing the wine, shipping it back to China. And uh, but what they're growing is not great stuff. It's uh, there's actually a big scandal recently about uh, a uh, a negotiant in France who was mislabeling a lot of the wines that he was sh sending to China. His wines were still selling out because they said Bordeaux on them or they said Burgundy or something like that. And that's that was the big selling point. So uh, so as far as the tariffs impact on the American market, yeah, it, it is going to have an impact. Retaliatory tariffs on Chinese steel, for example, is not going to help the American people. Steel is a product that's used to finish products here in the United States. So if you put a tariff on cheaper steel from China, that's going to increase building costs. It's going to increase the cost of automobiles. It's going to increase the cost of... Uh, airplane manufacturing, it's going to increase all of these other costs, and uh, that is passed on to the consumer ultimately. So uh, the, the the correct response to a Chinese tariff on American wine, now granted, their tariff on American wine is in response to our tariffs increasing on them, but they've yeah. also had tariffs on us for a long time too. But regardless of, of who started it, <laughs> yeah. who, who, regardless of who started it, the response should always be lower tariffs, lower taxes. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, we covered tariffs pretty hard, um, and I know you guys tackle way more issues than just that. So what are some of the top ways the government gets involved in the alcohol and wine industry besides tariffs? Um, well, there just uh, it is it is so permeated with government. It's 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 crazy. And, and honestly, I didn't know a lot of this stuff before Mason and I started doing the show. Uh, I just kind of thought like, you know, Prohibition ended and that was it. And and now alcohol is kind of like basically more or less free for people to drink and, and make and all that sort of stuff. But there's, there's a lot involved here. There's a lot of special interests involved. Uh, the larger your company, there's also people don't realize this in the wine industry in particular, there is huge, huge amounts of subsidies from the government. And uh, it's it's through the because well, they're farmers, right? Yeah, they're farmers. Exactly. Yeah. They get and they get and they're and a lot of them are very large agribusinesses. Agribusinesses are the ones that usually command uh, the most subsidies. And so, yeah, there there is a lot. We, we've uh, covered a, a lot of legislation that goes through the states and a lot of legislation that goes through the federal government that impacts it. Uh, there's recently been some uh, Supreme Court cases that have impacted the wine industry, in particular um, uh, interstate shipping. And uh, state regulation on things like residency laws for being able to sell wine in a state. So uh, that that's something that we cover. Texas ha recently had a proposed bill that would require uh, winemakers to use 100% uh, Texas grapes, which would impose a uh, in again in my opinion it would impose a uh, undue hardship on small producers because what they typically do is in on the federal level with the American viticulture areas. Uh, the AVAs, you have to use 75% of that uh, viticulture area's uh, grapes in your wine in order to call it that. So if uh, you know if you have a Napa Valley wine, for example, you can you have to use 75% of Napa Valley, but you could also use 25% from Sonoma or from Willamette Valley up in Oregon or from anywhere else. It doesn't matter where the other 25% come from. But wouldn't we, we wouldn't we want some of these rules so we know what we're getting? Um, there's other ways to do it and, and better ways in my opinion. So in Texas, for example, there was legislation going through that was going to force everybody that wanted to label their wine, Texas, to use 100% Texas grapes, which, so Texas is larger than France. Our, our largest viticulture area is, uh, is hill country and hill country is larger than something like seven countries in Europe. And each of those countries have a thriving wine industry with multiple viticulture areas. So it doesn't make sense to regulate wine on the level of, of, of a region the size of Texas. So even if even if somebody and, and I'll grant this to people, if you if you think government regulates the best, which I think the evidence is contrary to this, um, even in that case, it shouldn't be regulated on the on the scale of the size of Texas. Uh, it's, it's a very, very big place. <laughs> but uh the 
in Texas, there is a program called the 100% Texas Grown, and it's basically uh, you're, are you familiar with Meritage Blend wines? Yeah. Yeah. Meritage Blend is a certification process that's private, and it costs a dollar a case up to I think two hundred dollars. So you you pay a dollar a case to be able to say that your wine is Meritage. Uh, that means it's done in the Bordeaux style, and uh, it's certified by inspectors, and they'll come in, they'll make sure that you know you've got the I think it's five I think there's five grapes in in uh, Bordeaux. I think it's uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, Merlot, uh, Merveg or Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Or Petit Verdot, Verdot, that, for Petit Verdot, yeah. So, um, so the Meritage organization, there's a similar organization uh, that does. Um, I think it's GSM. I think GSM you have to be certified as well, but I could be mistaken on that. So, anyways, a similar program was coming up in Texas, which would just be a dollar a case, up to 200 cases or something along those lines, uh, and you get this little sticker that you can put on your on your bottle of wine that says you're 100% Texas. So. Why does the government need to come in, spend a bunch of extra tax dollars, from, even collected from people who don't drink wine, and uh, and spend a bunch of extra dollars? And this is it, it. It largely comes down to special interests. There are very large producers in Texas that currently produce fairly inexpensive wine from 100% Texas grapes, and they and we have a growing wine region, and we have a lot of small producers who are producing very good wine, and this legislation would be an undue hardship to them because they they're usually they're just filling that last 25% or or 10% with other stuff mm -hmm. and um the thing is is filling it with something else doesn't necessarily change the wine uh i mean it, it does change the wine but it doesn't necessarily impact it in a negative way i mean they a lot of times they're getting stuff from from california california just grows so much grapes but in other times another good example of this is texas high plains this year because of the bad weather and the hail and all that sort of stuff, they lost so much of their harvest that in order to produce a reasonable amount, you know, this is economies of scale, so you have to produce a certain amount in order to make any profit at all. They would need to lower the amount of Texas grapes used, fill the rest with, you know, New Mexico grapes right next door or something like that. And and that would increase the volume that they were able to produce so that they could break even for the year when they had such a, a bad year as far as weather goes. The other the other argument for this would be in Texas, uh, Texas, uh, there's a region here called Texoma. Texoma, uh, it spills into Oklahoma. So what happens when half of your vineyards in Oklahoma and half of your vineyards in Texas? So what about the half that's in Oklahoma? Like, do you have to still have? Can you only produce 100% Texas wine on one side and the other? And, and then the, the the additional argument is, what does Texas mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's too big. The viticulture areas do sort of mean something. The subregions mean more, and that was uh, Sibony Cellars, which is in Hill Country. They they actually made a very good argument for this, and they testified in uh, the legislature about it. Um, was uh, let's start at the sub AVA. If we want, we'll, we'll, we have our own trade associations. We can do this voluntarily. We don't need the government involved. And in the trade association, we can have – this is actually one point where Mason and I uh, disagree. I believe in trademark, and he thinks trademark silly. But uh, I would say that you, you basically you trademark uh, your subregion, and you sell the right to call the wine the trademarked subregion as long as they fulfill their 100 percent Texas-grown requirement uh, and – and that's where you would start. You can expand from there, but there's no reason to get the government involved. Uh, notoriously, the government is always driven by special interests. So whoever has got the most money and whoever can lobby the most or garnish the most um, you know, rabble-rousers or whatever, that's who's going to get done what they want done. It's not necessarily going to be the small producers. It's very damaging to small producers. And we, and we have a lot of, of evidence of this too in places like Oregon where – the Willamette Valley Wine Growers Association have started imposing a lot of restrictions on uh, uh, grapes grown on the valley floor in Willamette Valley, as well as uh, subregions in the Willamette Valley. The like Umpqua Valley is a subregion, and they have started imposing these reg regulations where they're saying, "Well, you can't call your wine Umpqua Valley wine because you're grown in the Willamette Valley, and the Umpqua Valley is not a federally recognized region." And that causes that puts an additional cost. Now, this is these are people who are don't want to go through the regula regulatory cost of getting their label approved for Willamette Valley. So this is also another another place where the government is heavily involved in wine. 
label approval is difficult and it's expensive. Um, if you've done it once, if you've done it once, usually it's fine. Now, I actually, last weekend, I was down visiting uh, Angelita Vineyard here in Texas. They have a vintage that is unlabeled this year. They can only sell it at the vineyard. And the reason was during the, the Trump shutdown, the, uh, the agency that approves labels was not approving labels. <laughs> and because they're a newer winery and it was a new wine, this had to go through additional processes. It wasn't just kind of like a carte blanche, just change the year, change the alcohol level, and, and you're good. This was a whole new label. It's, uh, it was on a, a Blanc de Bois, uh, which is American hybrid grape that is grown pretty widely here in Texas. Uh, they, they needed a approval for this, and they couldn't get approval for it, so it's an unlabeled – or it has a label, but it's not a, uh, it's not a federally approved label, so they can only sell it at the winery. And, um, that, that is it legally, they only could sell it at the winery. Correct. Yeah. So they can't, they can't ship it because of, uh, of, well, there's Texas regulations. So they, they could have shipped it in state if Texas regulations were slightly different, but they, uh, but they can't, they can't ship out of state either because they don't wow. have a federal label. So the government requires you to have a label and to go through a process to get it. The government shut down so they couldn't do that process. And therefore, they had wines that weren't labeled, and they couldn't sell it. Besides, right at their winery, that's in, that's crazy. Yeah, it, it it is, and you know, for for most growers, this is not a problem because once you get approved once, it's a very short approval process. All they have to do is they they basically look at the level and they go, you change the year. Like I mean, we can look at this this uh, the, like the the foreign labels don't have to be approved here, but you know, you've got here, you've got year, here, and then. Uh, I think it's on the bottom. Yeah, down here you've got 12.5% 12 12 .5 ABV. You have some uh, health and safety warnings here on the back. Those things don't change unless, unless some sort of law changes. They don't change. So all you need to do is change the year, the vintage, and the percentage of alcohol, and you'll be approved very quickly. The, the initial approval process, though, for a new wine, or and this actually happens with beer as well and liquor, is the the process is very long and drawn out to get a new one, particularly when the government shut down for you know two months or three months or whatever, and then they get backlogged. So like these are people trying to get their labels approved quickly. They can't sell them without the labels, and with certain types of alcohol, liquor for example, that's fine if you if you leave it. But for a uh, a young, particularly a young white wine and Blanc de Bois as well, because Blanc de Bois doesn't keep as well, um, you need to sell it quickly. Or, uh, and so you can't wait for the label. Like if it was a Cabernet Sauvignon or something like that, you could maybe put that on the shelf, wait for the label to get approved, and then sell it for a little bit more because it's a little bit older. And uh, and that would be fine. But uh, for a lot of these companies, they have they need to – you know, I used to work – I used to – I'm a software developer. I used to work in payroll. And uh, a lot of times people's payroll revenue streams are very, very slim. They need, they need to keep selling in order just to make payroll. And this is true for – for wineries as well, they, they are they are farmers and they are uh, wine producers, but they are also businesses. And uh, if they're not turning over stock, they don't have money to continue operations. And uh, so for things like a Blanc de Bois, you do need to sell it quickly. Uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon, if you're a very, very large producer, you could probably keep that for a little bit longer. And uh, for particularly like uh, the older Cabernet Sauvignons in California or something like that, depending on when they decide to label it, if it's if it's aging for a, a long period of time, they can wait one or two years to get their label approved. But for very young wines, they can't, um, and or wines that don't keep well. So that that's that's one area that they do. Uh, the taxes, people don't think about taxes, but so uh, actually Virginia is a good example of this. Virginia has um, a tiered system for taxes when it comes to alcohol. So uh, I think it's fourteen percent or fifteen percent. If uh, alcohol is under that percentage, actually it may even be lower. It might be 11%. If, mm -hmm. if the alcohol is lower than that, uh, your taxes are very are fairly low. I think it's like 10% or something like that. Once you go over that percentage, your taxes go up to like 30 or 40%. It's, 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 a, it's a huge increase. And this changes people's decisions in not only production but in consumption. So – there's a, there's a lot of beers that are not available in Virginia because their alcohol is very high or their alcohol is uh, indeterminate, meaning that it changes while it's in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And Virginia doesn't allow that to be sold there uh, because they can't they don't know what level to tax it at or if it should be sold at an ABC or a, a wine retailer or a beer store or, or so on and so forth. And so they don't allow it to be sold there. 
And so there's uh, the Dogfish Head 190-minute uh, IPA that used to not be available in Virginia. Uh, it, it took them a long time to get approval for that because once it's in the bottle, it, the alcohol level increases because there's still uh, residual sugars in there and the yeast is still alive. It's a great beer, by the way. It is. A, it's a great beer, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but they but while it's in the bottle, so it, for years it wasn't available in Virginia, and it was because of this tax regulation. So this this these uh, people don't often think about how the government is involved in their drink, but it also impacts your decisions on what to buy because the prices change. And all prices are is a signal to the market to say, hey, I'm here, this is what I cost, and then you have to, as a consumer, decide what do I want, and, and price is a factor in that. Now, there's a lot of wines and stuff that I would buy regardless of the price as long as it was in my budget, um, but... But know, not everyone's that way, yeah. Exactly. Not everybody's that way. A lot of people, they go to the store and they go, well, I could get this, you know, 24 pack of Natty Light because it's super cheap. But if I go just a little bit higher in the alcohol level, it the, the price increase is astronomical. And it's not necessarily a quality thing either. Just because something's got high alcohol doesn't mean it's a high quality product. And so, but that kicks them out of the Natty Light or out of the other product and down to the Natty Light. And so then they end up making these decisions for very, you know, people are very brand loyalty when it comes to beer as well. So, when you're young and you're introduced to these beers that are what I would say is low quality, but you know, again, value subjective. So um, you you end up getting these natty lights. A lot of people will stick with that for a long time. Now, I think our generation is a little bit different in that um, in that regard, but uh, but this does have an impact in things. And you know, I think that this is one thing that Mason and I have talked about a little bit on the show. This I think is one of the reasons why rosés are so popular right now, is because rosés tend to be lower alcohol level. And that does impact in a lot of states the price. Uh, yeah. And so if you if you have the option of either getting a really robust, great red wine from Bordeaux, or uh, maybe like a rosé from Piedmont, and the and the le- and the cost is just astronomically different, you may go with the Piedmont rosé instead. They're both French wines, and they're both you know you both get that prestige of it being foreign or whatever. And if you don't know very much about it, you might you might just go ahead and go with the rosé. Yeah. You know. So that's, 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 those are a couple of the examples. We do go into it a lot more in depth. I mean, every, there's no shortage of stories. Every episode we have something. Yeah. So my last question is, is there anything that you say the government does well as far as uh, in the alcohol or wine industry? Um, Once in a while, we, we will get a story well, I'll, where I'll say I'm torn on this because on the one hand, I think – so I, I'll say usually it's when it's like a, a state or local government versus a higher level of government. That's usually when I'll say like they'll, they're doing better. To a large degree, I do think the American viticulture system is set up fairly well. Uh, it's very easy to get a new viticulture area. Uh, there's actually several in Texas that don't even – they have like one winery in them or something like that. They're, they're not even – they're not very big. Uh, so it's fairly easy to get a viticulture area set up. They they might be – you know, if, if we're talking the government has to exist, we, we might talk about them being slightly more restrictive in that in that sense. But uh, I think that it's it's fairly easy for people to kind of set up their own trademark system and, and create trade associations to do that. So I guess to answer the question in short, yeah, I think the American viticulture system is actually not terrible. Uh, it, it, it's reasonably understandable. It's, uh, they, it's nice that they don't respect state lines. Uh, and, and that's very helpful because terroir doesn't care about your line on the map. It cares about the soil type, the environment, uh, the, in Climate. a lot of places. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the, yep. the, the viticulture practices, the growing tradition, the, the wine making tradition, that sort of thing. So, uh, and they and they've also allowed people to to a large degree in those viticulture areas discover what grows well there. Uh, awesome. So you know you, we've got we've got uh, Oregon is is very well known for Pinot Noir, but in particular Willamette Valley is well known for Pinot Noir, and that took a long time for them to discover that there was nobody coming in from higher up and saying, oh, you have to grow this. It it just took time, and they and they figured it out. And there's other stuff there, like I think they also grow a lot of Chardonnay up in in the Willamette Valley. Um, not not my favorite varietal, and and they could probably be doing uh, I think uh, better white varietals, but I mean that's that's my opinion. But uh, they they to a large degree have a kind of allowed people to sort of go their own way, and they are 
fairly impacted by trade associations. So in that regard, I, I think the American viticulture, viticulture area is is very hands off, and I think in they do a pretty good job with that. We'll see if that stays because we do have a lot of viticulture areas trying to be introduced right now, and there's a lot of trade associations who are resisting that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, once you've once you've had the drug of the government, it's hard to quit it. So you got uh, very large trade associations like the Willamette Valley Wine Growers Association who have been bringing state sponsored lawsuits against California uh, producers who, who have also not been. You know, there, there's no good guys in in a lot of these situations. Like, uh, you know, are you familiar with Copper Cane? No. Okay, Copper Cane's a very very large producer in California, and they're kind of shady. Uh, and and also the, the dude who owns it, for lack of a better way of putting it, he's kind of an asshole. So, uh, he does, he does these things that are like, they're shady. Like he'll like, so he has, uh, some grapes that, or he has some vineyards that he buys from in, in Willamette Valley. And then he'll kind of, he won't follow the rules for that are kind of put forward by the trade associations. And instead of, he won't call it Willamette Valley, but he'll say Oregon, which he's allowed to say. And then he'll call the wine, something like the Willameter. So, but it doesn't say Willamette Valley. It, it, but it, the but it's called like the Willamette like the Willamette Journal or something like that. So he's not really the greatest guy. But the the problem that I have with the lawsuit is that the the Willamette Valley Wine Growers Association went to the state of Oregon and got them to spend money for, from people who don't necessarily drink wine to help bring lawsuits against this guy and his company, and and that I I feel that is an issue. But um, that's not a federal problem. That's a state problem. So this yeah. is one place where. You know, the federal government actually was pretty hands off on it. They said, look, you guys figure it out on your own. And yeah, I feel like if you have a uh, wine certification company or some association that people really trust and they can put their stamp of approval on something, I mean, that's that's self-regulating enough in the private sector. Yeah, it's and it's great. And, you know, uh, biodynamic wines do a very good job with that. Uh, and there's a big there's a big argument with biodynamic wines versus USDA organic wines. Um, and actually, have you been following the, the, the quote unquote natty wine arguments lately? No, I haven't followed that. Yeah. So there's like there's this whole big fight right now about like natural wines and like there's no definition for natural wine. So this is this is a place where people are trying to invite the government in to do regulation on it. Um, whereas I feel like there's just a market opportunity for somebody to come up with a natural wine certification. So a lot of people are are, start, are doing things like calling their wine a natural wine just because it's unfiltered. Hmm. So like, but what does that mean? Or or it's or it's a natural wine because it has no sulfur. But like, they've been using sulfur in wine for thousands of years. So yeah. like, so what's the I, I, what are you talking about? And that's kind of one of those things where. A lot of people who are not really in the wine industry, they, they'll look at this and they'll go, oh, it's a natural wine. And in their mind, they're associating this with biodynamic or USDA organic or something like that. And USDA organic does mean something. They at least have some standards, although it's incredibly corrupt. But uh, it does it does mean something. And whereas natural wine doesn't mean anything. Nobody's taking a trademark on it or anything like that. And you can just kind of call whatever you want, whatever you want. And it's a little bit deceitful. Like I, I never buy a wine that's, that says natural on it. I, I always – if it says biodynamic – that this could be a very good wine. I've had very, very good biodynamic wines. I uh, I had an interview with um, Craig Camp of uh, Troon Vineyards in, uh, I think it's Applegate Valley in Oregon. Uh, he is a bi- biodynamic grower. It's it's a really good episode, and he kind of goes into like what biodynamic wine is. It's kind of like witchcraft sort of mixed with organic, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, I'm going to check that one out. Yeah, they, they produce just – they produce – a lot of the biodynamic growers, they just produce really good wine. And there, there's a lot of arguments for that. Some like the biodynamic growers would say it's because of the practice and the people who are not really opponents of it, but also have it, don't believe in like magic and phases of the moon and that kind of thing. Um, they'll say it's because the growers are more hands-on. Mm. Um, I think it's kind of a long, you know how like people say that like uh, Pinot Noir is a ghost. Uh, it, it has no substance of its own, but it's the full expression of the terroir of where it's yep. grown. Yeah, uh, Pinot Noir. I feel like it varies so much in quality, like from like god awful to this is some of the most complex best wine I've had. I, oh, I totally agree, and I think biodynamic has a lot of that in it as well because it's it is done in such a way that it's like the full expression as much as possible of terroir. Mm-hmm. So you you will get these uh, like Craig Camp at uh, Trune Vineyards. He they're doing a lot of. Um, 
red blends there and like they ha they're going for something different so like they so when you when you drink his wines you just have this this totally different experience and it's the experience of the Applegate Valley and hmm. I've gone through I've gone camping in the Applegate Valley a few times and like now this is part of again the subjectivity of wine is that like when, sometimes when I drink those Madoc wines um, I'm like brought back in my mind to uh, camping in California when I was a kid because I, I grew up in California so camping in California because there's particularly on the coast because there's this in some of the Madoc particularly Hout Madoc or however you say it um, there is a like a kelpiness in in a lot of it where yeah. like pretty, especially if you get like the 2014 um, there was something about that year where it was just it had this like sea flavor to it whereas like it was just like a, a tiny, tiny bit of this like kelp and hmm. uh, such an interesting thing. And then like it's like a time vortex in your mind where you're just like brought back to this place that, that that's one of the cool things about wine and flavor in general is that like you're just like Zhoo! you're wished into like whatever your mind associates with the flavor and the smell. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. Totally. hundred percent. So do you want to segue into reviewing the wines we got? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Do uh, you want to go first? Sure. So, um, like I said earlier, it is a um, uh, Medoc, Hot Medoc from the Bordeaux region of France. And this came, it retails around $35. It was actually in the twenty mid-20s when we got it at Total Wine. So I was really surprised it was, it was going for that cheap. And it's a 2016 and... Um, I know a lot of the wines on the, the left uh, bank typically like to age well. They're very heavy Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so I decanted this for about an hour and a half to two hours to try to accelerate some of that oxidation a little bit. And I think it, it probably helped. I didn't try it beforehand, but um, it definitely has a lot of fruitiness to it for a, uh, for a, for a French wine. I would say in general, like some of the ones I've had in um, like Burgundy region were a lot more earthy than this. And this has like a lot of like black currant notes to it and uh, some black cherry. But it's also got a lot of that smokiness and like a little bit of leather to it as well. So I kind of like it's not like a super jam punch that you get from a lot of the California cab salves. But um, overall, I mean, it's a good mix of kind of fruitiness but also has some elements of old world to it as well so i really enjoy it and that sounds that sounds very good i got i've got total wine here i should go check and see if they have that as well although although i've got like upwards of 90 bottles of wine that i i should get through <laughs> eventually but <laughs> I, I have i have this weird personality where when i get into something i get really into it and then i mm -hmm. start like also like i'm young i don't have kids i i it ends up being kind of like i have a disposable income so I end, up, mm -hmm. I end up spending on them dumb things. All right. Well, it's not, not that it's dumb, but uh, the wine that I have, I also have a Bordeaux because uh, we were going to talk a little bit about France, and we also discussed that um, that we would both do a Bordeaux. I'll kind of – if I can put the label here, I don't know if it's legible, but it's uh, it's a Chateau, Chateau Arthur Ar, – Arthus. I want to say Arthur, but it's Arthus. It's Chateau mm -hmm. Arthus. It's uh, – the the region formerly known as Castellon, it's now Cote de, Cote de Bordeaux. Uh, so as as we mentioned earlier, Cote de Bordeaux was uh, a four or five regions I can't recall the number that joined together uh, because they were not doing as well as some of the larger ones like Madoc, uh, and so they went ahead and joined together for marketing. Uh, so Cote, they they chose Cote de Bordeaux. Uh, as their marketing arm. Castellon is very, very, very close to St. Emilion, particularly uh, Chateau Arthos. They could be in St. Emilion if they went like half a mile down the road. And uh, But they're not. They're in Castellon. And uh, it is uh, very... I don't know what the I don't know what the blend is on it because the French don't usually put that. I would say just based on taste that it's very, very Merlot heavy. Probably has some Cab Franc if it just, you know, judging by where the location is. Um, so it's, it's a right bank. Correct. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're typically more heavy Merlot. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's Merlot. It probably has a little bit of Cab Franc, might have some Cab Sauve in it. It does have a little bit of tannic uh, grip to it, but not very much at all. It's very, very smooth. 
Uh, it does have uh, a very pleasant ruby color. Uh, one of the things I like about red wines is that you do get this diversity in the redness uh, based on age, which is kind of cool, but also based on the grape and how long it's been on the skin. I just think that's kind of neat. And um, I've, I've been learning a lot more about color, the co very pleasant ruby. Uh, the the smell that I get from it, I'm reading my notes, <laughs> uh, sour, sour red fruits, uh, a little bit of smokiness. And um, so again, sort of along your lines, I was actually surprised at how fruity the, the uh, aroma was of this, um, as opposed to the smokiness or the earthiness that you typically get from French wines. But Bordeaux, Bordeaux does tend to be a little bit more along the lines of the British and American palate, which is a little bit more fruity, fruit forward. Uh, the taste-wise, definitely red fruit forward, um, but not so much so that uh, you can't tell that it's a Bordeaux wine. It does have that sort of slaty mineraliness that you get from uh, right bank of Bordeaux. Uh, it does have a, a little bit of the smokiness, a little bit of the leather, kind of tobacco notes on it that um, is, is pretty typical of Europe. And uh, it also had a very, very, like I said, low tannins, um, not really a lot of the grippiness. It did have a very nice balanced acidity, and it, did and it stayed with me for a while. So I, I think um, as far as that goes, I highly recommend it, especially for the price. Right now, Cote de, Cote, Cote de Bordeaux, uh, they have – different subregions, but the entire uh, domain is a very good deal. This was 19.99. I also got it at Total Wine, and um, I got this. There, I, I do I do classes online with um, another podcast called Wine for Normal People. She recommended that we get uh, Castillon Cote de Bordeaux because it was a budget-friendly French wine, and we did some classes on budget-friendly French wines, and uh, definitely recommend it. This is a 2014 um, – Check it out if if you get a chance, and just just go look and see what do they have from Cote de, Cote de, Cote de Bordeaux. Uh, I also noticed though that my total wine has not separated uh, the subregions of Cote de Bordeaux into its own section. They're still in their own places. Now, granted, I live in a big city. I live in Dallas, so uh, the total wine here is huge. And uh, but the total wines in in Virginia are also fairly large, especially like in Virginia Beach. The one there is very big. The one in Norfolk is is uh, well it's not as big as the one in virginia beach but it's pretty big and they have a very wide selection i'm sure they'll have something similar to this uh, mm -hmm. i definitely recommend that's where i picked up this one the one in norfolk oh yeah the yeah. the one uh the one in ghent uh i think it was more towards uh chesapeake than oh, uh, ghent. oh okay yeah 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 okay i i know that one yeah it's my old stomping grounds yeah <laughs> awesome so is there anything else that you want to add and anything you want to plug for your podcast or anything else? Um, well, I just say you guys can follow us uh, at Tasting Anarchy on Twitter. Um, you can also go to our website, Tasting Anarchy at um, tastinganarchy.com. If you ever want to email me, I am very responsive, tastinganarchy at gmail.com. Uh, we also do a anarchist festival here in Texas called Childeberg. And... Uh, you can go to childeberg.com for more information, sign up for the newsletter. You can also follow Childeberg on Twitter and check that out. If you're in Texas and you're interested in just hanging out with cool people, I'll, I'll be there. I'm bringing wine. Mason will be there too, who's my co-host. Um, you can come hang out with us. There'll be free drinks, free wine, um, and probably free food, but I'm not going to guarantee it because I'm not bringing the free food. But the, the last one we did, people brought so much barbecue and so much like hot dogs and hamburgers and all that sort of stuff that they, everything was free. So uh, you can come check that out and just hang out with us for a couple of days. It's going to be at uh, Emma Long Metropolitan Park in Austin. Awesome. And uh, you just had one. What When is the date for the next? Oh, uh, it's um, uh, March, April, uh, May 23rd. Make sure I get these dates right. May 23rd through 26th okay. uh, in 2020. So... The uh, Libertarian National Convention, which is the party that we're loosely associated with, is uh, around that time, and uh, or it's it's at the exact same time actually. They'll be going on, so we're putting it we're putting it on uh, 20 minutes down the street from that. So anybody who goes to the Libertarian National Convention and wants to come camp with us and hang out at the park and go swimming and play cornhole and you know that kind of thing, <laughs> and don't really care that much about politics because we're kind of we're getting to the point where we we don't care that much about the the politics we do care about politics and government in general and philosophy and things like that but uh most of the right anarchists have sort of given up on the political struggle and are more into things like counter economics uh so 
if you're into Bitcoin, that's another reason to come. There's going to be tons of Bitcoin people there. Uh, so that's that's really it. I think that's all my plugs. Awesome. That sounds great. And I thank you so much for your time and coming to talk and educating us about uh, how the government's in your glass. So oh, absolutely. Really appreciate it. All right. I'll talk to you online. All right. Hey, Corkies. Thanks for watching this episode. Remember, guys, if you're not on the Facebook group, Cork and Java, it's a great place with great interaction with our content. Also, find us on Twitter. It's at Cork Java. And also on Pinterest, Cork and Java there. We got a lot of good stuff on the boards there. So make sure to check us out online. And until next time, bottoms up. Yeah.